Recently, I've been thinking a lot about time. Just recursively expending this finite resource just to ponder its own existence? I mean, what's the deal with that? I think it naturally comes with getting older. I'm 23 for reference. When you're going to school most days, I feel like it's difficult to get a realistic idea of how much time you really have and how valuable it is. And then there's the realization of how much time you're losing when you're working 40 hours That's a so week at a hours. place that you're not extremely passionate about. I was in the break room talking to my coworkers who are 18 and 20 about Call of Duty 19 Modern Warfare 2 the remake. They're likely playing it as I say these words and I hope they're having a blast. The last Call of Duty that I actually got into was Black Ops 2 on the 360, and while I could make a few arguments for why it's one of, if not the best in the series, I would say the primary reason that I played it as much as I did was because I was in the 8th grade. And I don't mean to imply that adults shouldn't spend their time playing Call of Duty, hot take incoming, you should play the games that you like. But in retrospect, the primary thing that had me locked into Call of Duty was the progression. Building the account, unlocking the gear, seeing the numbers go up. And that's not to say that Call of Duty isn't a mechanically enjoyable game, but evidently to me, it was not mechanically satisfying enough for me to have kept up with and invested my time into the series since 2012. And on a personal level, that's maybe a good thing, because I just recently escaped the sweet and evil clutches of another game that put its progression system in your face. I found it very mechanically satisfying, and it did not respect my time. Or money, oh my god. And so, lately, I have found myself really valuing not necessarily short, but compact experiences. Across all mediums, I respect so much the ability to establish themes and execute on a concept succinctly, and to leave the viewer, reader, player with something substantive to chew on, at least for a little while. Bad End Theater gave me one of my favorite types of experiences with a game. An idea is presented. That idea is executed in a way that slaps, I see the end credits in less than 90 minutes, but if I wanted to play more, there is a reason to do so. In this game, you've been invited to get in a story that's endings have been predetermined. Kind of like all video games. There are 44 endings. And they're all bad. The story can be experienced from four different character viewpoints. As you play through the story, you're confronted with different choices that then unlock specific behaviors for that character. Then back at the menu, you set those characters' behaviors while you run through the story from a different perspective. And from there, the whole game is just a giant logic puzzle science experiment. That ends bad. If I make this combination of characters behave in these ways, how will that change the storyline from this character's point of view? And so on and so forth. Thankfully, the end credits can be seen without unlocking all 44 endings, but if you wanted to do that, the game makes it very easy to see which endings you don't have and how to get them. And you get these little letters for getting all the endings for one character. I like that. And the song that plays after the end credits is some slow-ass Harley Quinn bedroom pop Undertale type shit, and it was beautiful and it made me cry. It's cute, the writing is clever, and it handles some pretty dark subject matter in a way that keeps the experience lighthearted. I'm drawing attention to that to accentuate the upcoming tonal shift in the next game. Oh yeah, there it is. Milk Outside a Bag of Milk Outside a Bag of Milk is a sequel to Milk Inside a Bag of Milk Inside a Bag of Milk. Both games are interesting for the same reasons, but the second one is newer, longer, and more stylized, so that's what we're getting into here. The games center around a girl with an unspecified mental illness, although you could maybe derive that from the colors and imagery. Most of the gameplay takes place in her room. You kind of play as the girl, but more specifically, the player takes the role of what is assumed to be the girl's subconscious, or one of the voices within it. She's up late having trouble sleeping, so you spend the next real-time hour engaging in banter, collecting her scattered thoughts depicted as fireflies, you remind her to take her meds, engage in unhelpful negative self-talk that most creatives can relate to. The game has this unique and really effective way of wholly enveloping you for its runtime. It's weird, it's dark, it's disturbing. The imagery and audio can be harsh and disorienting. 
But I don't know, I found it kind of, like, comforting at times. Something about just looking at this room, disheveled yet meticulously put together, devoid of all complex color, the way the background just hovers and contorts on its own, it feels like nothing even could exist outside this room. Like being up early before the whole world has woken up. You know that time is moving, but it feels frozen. And the dialogue reinforces this by giving this sense that we're always talking around something. You're in this girl's head. She's not going to start rattling off specifics about events you're meant to be aware of. And that things aren't being said, I feel, is what's being communicated more so than the event we're skirting around. Facts about the girl's past and present can be uncovered, but I don't know if the game really expects you to put all of those pieces together. There's five different endings, and all but the default require you to skip certain cutscenes or fail at the game's one actual mission and not get all the fireflies. And I never would have figured that out. It betrays the showman and gamer within me. The game seems much more interested in the tone and immediacy of the experience itself. And that's the real sauce here, taking a small-scale, personal experience and depicting it in a way that feels world-encompassing, while still breaking up the despair with moments of levity and humanity. It won't be for everyone, but both games combined are like $10. And if this kind of thing is your bag, there are many things about milk outside a bag of milk outside a bag of milk that make it a compact experience with a lot to chew on, at least for a little while. But if I can't complete it fast, make it come back toable, you know? Preserve it nicely without my input. It is both frustrating yet expected when a game gets more difficult to play the longer you've been away from it. I would love to be able to call on all the information and experience I have amassed to, at will, drop 30 kills in a slayer, become the king at the party, and have the mayor give me the key to the city. In reality, the game sense and muscle memory that I had for Halo when I was 14 would have to be honed or at least maintained over years of practice that I wouldn't have time for. And that's why you gotta give it up for Citizen Sleeper. It's a little like Halo. Citizen Sleeper is a text-heavy sci-fi survival RPG where what you do matters way more than what you say. And I like it. A good 60% of your responses in dialogue are for roleplay purposes only. That is to say the outcome is the same regardless of what you pick. Citizen Sleeper gets a pass because of the other 40%, but much more importantly, the way that you unlock dialogue and progress with the story is through the game's survival, action, and time systems, which encourage a ton of player freedom. Sleepers are a whole group of second-class citizens with emulated minds and robot bodies, after basically being lied to by corporate propaganda, a bunch of people sold their bodies to a company called Essen Arp. But like only the bare minimum of the self makes it over to the emulated mind, so they have fractions of their memories at best. Many people you encounter will question the validity of your sentience, and Essen Arp is eager to reclaim what they deem to be lost property. So you need every friend you can get. You arrive on Elrin's Eye after your transport ship explodes and you are saved from cryostasis by Dragos. And from there, it's time to get to work. Like most corporate products, your robot body is built with planned obsolescence, so it needs upkeep. Your condition and energy are the main meters you need to monitor. Both deplete some every in-game day, or cycle, with energy doing so much faster. It can be restored via eating food, working certain jobs, or sunbathing at your house. It is important to try and maintain two or three full energy bars, because if it's depleted at the end of a cycle, you will lose even more condition. And that's really bad, because the number of actions you get per cycle is based on your condition. And the space Adderall needed to fully restore your condition is not cheap. As you could assume, all the actions are carried out through dice rolls, a mechanic that the art team should all get raises for stylizing and incorporating so hard into the art design. Because, like, the idea to represent a six on a die as the chambers in a six-shooter is so badass, but also, like, Why didn't I think of that? Some actions are repeatable, some are one-time, some pose greater risk and yield greater reward, 
but they were all in service of staying alive, building connections with people, and filling up your good yellow circles before the bad red circles fill up. So, initially, you might think that waking up every day with all fives and sixes is the best possible role, and yeah, for a lot of situations that is quite good until you realize that certain encryption keys and data caches can only be unlocked with a specific numbered die, normally a 1, 2, or 3. And it's actually deceptive how the game treats these numbers versus how you would instinctively expect them to work. In fact, the difference between a 1 and a 6 is significant, but not egregiously so because every action die above the number 3 simply introduces the chances for an action to have a positive outcome, versus neutral or negative. Even if you played a 1 on a risky action, your chances of achieving a neutral outcome are still 50-50. And the game calls it neutral, but it really is positive. You just get less rewards and progression than a true positive outcome would have yielded. There's a simple inventory system, money, data, scrap, as well as a variety of quest items, some of which serve as logic puzzles, but others are big player choices that will have long-standing consequences for you and me. In real life, the ship mind. Is it that you have heard about at least 10 times before actually acquiring one. Presently, I am only aware of three ways to get one, and regardless of how you did it, it's a really big deal that you did. Before you even know how to get a ship mind, you could be well aware of two different characters who need one. So if you decide to use it to free the human consciousness trapped in the vending machine, then you need to figure out how to make another if you want to help Ankita get her fix shipped. And you're probably gonna want to do that because helping NPCs complete their quests is what gives you skill points because yes, there's a skill tree in this game where you read and drag squares. The first whole tier are just flat increases to your rolls but one step up is the stuff that's really going to save your ass. Being able to use scrap to repair your condition is insanely good, maybe borderline broken because of how early on you can get scrap. And the ability to re-roll all of your remaining die once per cycle is also just super nice. Even after you've expended all of your actions, you choose when each cycle ends. That coupled with the autosaves after doing basically anything, the game really encourages you to go at your own pace. You could speed through 200 cycles in a week, or you could go IV drip feed type and just play 1 to 3 cycles every real day for the next year. All of these mechanics and systems just point back to each other and encourage you to think about them as a loop, a cycle, if you will. Do things for people and resources. People give you more things to do. Use the resources to do more things. That is how Citizen Sleeper has respected my time. No matter how long I've been away from the eye, it takes only moments to reacquaint myself with where I was and what needs doing. And in that time I'm away from the game, I'm still thinking about it quite often, lingering questions. Where is Sabine? When will Fang actually remove my tracker? What is the true nature of this shadow data realm and its inhabitants? That's where the strength of the game's writing comes in. It has smart world building that is certainly important, but knows how to get out of the way for more character-driven personal stories. And then a lot of those stories evolve in ways that bring the world back in and reveal things about this civilization's history in a really revelatory way. The story is very Onion-like like that. I don't even have time to delve into all the words ending in ism that this game is commenting on, dog. I have also just been spamming the OST recently. It is super spacey and atmospheric and meditative while not being ambient. It has memorable rhythms and melodies, actually. For thinking, stretching, writing, sleeping, these are my tunes right now. The level of restraint with which the soundtrack is used in the game is mind-blowing and respectable. A lot of the time, the game just sounds like this. But then you hear that... But then you hear that shit start bumping and it's really like, whoa, okay, let's get to reading. At time of recording, I have completed about 65 cycles and I think I'm close to seeing an ending, but to be honest, I have no clue. I thought I was in the end game like three hours ago. And unlike a lot of the story heavy games that I've played, that fact actually doesn't drive me insane. 
normally I have this compulsion to beat story games fast to avoid spoilers. Uh, I beat Persona 5 in a week and there's only one thing in that game you really could spoil. But despite the positive reviews, I don't really think Citizen Sleeper is blowing up. I haven't had to avoid spoilers for it like some shows I'm literally afraid to tell people I'm watching. So there are no forces, in-game or external, that are gonna keep me from spending as much time with the game as I want over as much time as I want. Until I die, of course. Jeg spurgte ind til Anders, om det var sandt, han var død tre gange. Anders, han var født og opvokset på en vej, der hedder Pine Road ude i skovene. Og derfra gik han ind til Elk hver dag. Welcome to Elk is a game about storytelling. But I think, even more so, Welcome to Elk is a game about the necessity of having someone to tell your story to. And I've been nice until now, but I'm going to spoil a lot of stuff in this game. Early to mid game stuff. You play as Frigg. She's awesome. She runs stupid. But so does everyone else in this game. It's actually pretty cute. And you should get used to it because most of the game is just move and interact. You have to walk home drunk at this one part and Frigg is really hard to control. She's like ignoring your inputs. It's hilarious. You arrive at the small island town of Elk as a carpenter's apprentice. You won't be doing any carpentry. Yeah. Each day something else is going down in the town. Your presence is required. Thankfully, the game is really smart with its art design, notating everything interactable simply by it just being in color. The pacing stays solid, and the chance for frustration is near non-existent, because the moment you walk into a room, it's immediately clear what needs inspecting and who needs talking to. The carpenter you came to help, Jan? He's got it, you're good. Go get wasted, do karaoke, play some golf. Put down a rabbit with your bare hands. Or don't. There's lots of great characters to get to know. This is Yep. He is the ferryman. He brought you here. On day two, you find him frozen to death. And then start tripping while carrying his corpse. And now you're peeking. Wait, now you're peeking. Everyone spends the whole day understandably sad. It's really depressing. And then you get back to your house and there's just this guy there that you've never seen before. He's never appeared anywhere else on the island. And when you interact with him, he reveals that he knows Frigg's name. And then all of a sudden we're watching live action footage of the real man this guy is based on telling the story of when he found a guy named Yep who was frozen to death. And now you're really peaking, dude. Everything that happens in the town while Frigg is there is based on a real story that actually happened to the developers or someone that they knew. In real life, actually. They tell you that in the marketing, but I decided to withhold that information until now for dramatic effect. The next day, a literal message in a bottle appears on your table with that story in writing. And these stories will keep appearing every day. By the end of the game, this table is full of bottles. And this whole concept just gives me chills thinking about it. Like me even talking about it right here, right now, makes it so many layers deep already. Like, this guy told his story to the devs, knowing that they were going to tell it to me. And maybe on some level, the devs told me because they knew there was a chance I'd tell it to you. And I'm talking about this game to tell a bigger story about games that respect your time. And I'm telling that story to weave together an even larger story about my channel and the way that I'm perceived on the internet as a guy with good video game opinions. <sighs> And then later, you're walking around in this rich dude's house when suddenly it's like, oh. I, I hear voices? Based on the story of the frozen man from my dad. If we put Frigg in the situation where she had Did they just say Frigg? Wait. That's, that's the devs. And they're talking about making the sequence where you carry Yep's body? Oh my god, they're telling you the story of how that scene came together. Frigg is certainly an active participant in this scene, but this sequence is for the developers to acknowledge you, the player, and for you to acknowledge them. 
the real people with the real stories that have amalgamated together to create the story that you are now a part of, via Frigg. And it really just makes you think about how art is a form of communication, and it can't really reach its full potential without someone to be the recipient of whatever it is that's meant to be communicated. Like, I liked making this video, but I'm also really glad that you watched it. The viewer, the reader, the player, they are an essential part of this unique and beautiful human experience that we call art, and their time is finite. And so in the spirit of respecting your time, I have nothing else to say and this video is over now.